and welcome to the Renaissance English History Podcast, a member of the Agora Podcast Network. I'm your host, Heather Tesco, and I'm a storyteller who makes history accessible because I believe it's a pathway to understanding who we are, our place in the universe, and deepening our connection to our own humanity. This is episode 108. It's another joint episode with Melita Thomas from Tudor Times on Mary, the French queen, Henry VIII's sister, who famously married for love. But first, admin. I want to thank the lovely patrons of this show who helped to keep it independent. Thank you to Elizabeth, Kathy, Cynthia, Jurgen, Sarah, Megan, Melissa, Lady Anne, aka Jessica, Olivia, Al, Ashley, Kendra, Cynthia, Judith, Renee, Katie, Mara, Emily, Selene, Lara, Ian, Barbara, Shar, Kiva, Amy, Allison, Joanna, Kathy, Christine, Annetta, that's my mama, Susan, Andrea, Catherine, Rebecca from Tudor's Dynasty, Shandor, Philip, and John. To learn more about how you can become a part of this intelligent and discerning group of people for as little as a dollar an episode, go to patreon.com slash Englandcast. Also, I've got a hugely important crowdfunding campaign on at the moment. I'm raising funds to pay for the printing of the 2019 Tudor Planner, which is the weekly monthly planner diary that's filled with Tudor history, all wrapped up in a cover that looks like an illuminated manuscript. There are a number of changes and improvements this coming year, largely based on your feedback, and my printing costs have gone up. So I have an Indiegogo campaign running for about three more weeks. The link to that is at englandcast.com or on the Facebook page. There are some awesome perks that you get for coming in as an early backer. In addition to my everlasting thanks, there is actually like stuff and bonuses and prizes that you get. (laughs) depending on which level you choose. Thank you so much for your support. We're just one week in and already 35% funded, and I'm thrilled with the response and so grateful to everybody who got behind this project early on. So now let me introduce you to Melita. Melita Thomas is a co-founder and editor of Tudor Times, a website devoted to Tudor and Stuart history in the period from 1485 to 1625. You can find it at tudortimes.co.uk. Melita, who has always been fascinated by history ever since she saw the 1970s series Elizabeth R. with Glenda Jackson, also contributes articles to BBC History Extra and Britain Magazine. I really don't know much about Mary, and it seems like there's a lot um, a lot of recent stuff, a couple of books and stuff that have come out about her. So um, it seems like it, she's becoming more popular, I suppose, um, or... At least, I don't know, maybe I'm just finally noticing it. <laughs> well, sort of, I mean, I, I think these things go through fashions, don't they? People become interested in, in somebody in particular and there'll be a spate of books about them and then it attention turns to somebody else. Um, Mary's always been considered quite a romantic figure, I think. So there were a couple of um, sort of romance books about her during the Victorian period and um, because she chose to marry without... A formal consent from Henry VIII and she married for love which was very unusual in those days she's um yeah always always been considered rather romantic and she was also uh, particularly uh, beautiful apparently which I know all princesses are called beautiful but Mary seems to have been um you, you know outstandingly good looking yeah so what can you tell me about her early life as a princess and before the first marriage and her childhood well, her early childhood, uh, it, it started out, um, she was born in uh, 1495, six, check that. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, she was born in March. And it was just in the period when Henry VII was um, beset by the Perkin Warbeck troubles. So one of Mary's earliest memories will have been uh, being taken to the tower as a a protection when the Cornish rebels were encamped at Blackheath. So Elizabeth of York and her children went to the tower to keep them safe. Um, Whether Mary will have remembered that is is, she was very young, but Henry VIII is thought to have been um, quite badly traumatised by it. Uh, So her very early childhood, she was um, surrounded with love and affection. She had two parents. She had several brothers and sisters uh she was she spent most of her time at Eltham Palace with um Henry and Margaret. Prince Arthur was brought up separately. Her mother was 
probably closer to her than most royal mothers are. And there's quite a few examples of Elizabeth uh, visiting the children and sending presents for them. And I mean, Henry VII too was quite a doting father. Uh, he paid he paid for her loot, and yeah, I mean, obviously he paid for everything for her because he was her father and the king. But you know, there are elements of of sort of personal touch in the accounts. And then it all went, it all started to go sour. In 1499, um, there was the first first death. Her little brother Edmund died at aged 18 months. So, so he died in um, 1500, I think. Uh, then there was this spectacular marriage of her brother Arthur to Princess Catherine. So that was a bit of a high point. Mary, who was seven by then, she had a couple of new dresses for the occasion. So you can imagine she had one of crimson velvet and one of russet velvet. So, you know, they dressed that they were dressed like little adults. But then Arthur died uh, within a few months. And the following year, Mary's mother died in childbirth. So from a, a sort of very sunny early childhood, it then became quite depressing as Henry VII's I mean, who wouldn't suffer from depression if they lost two children and their wife? And then uh, Margaret, the older daughter, went off to Scotland. So everything became really rather sombre. It, matters picked up a bit in the in the middle years, 1504 to 1507. And Mary became the focus of attention as she was betrothed to the Archduke Charles. Uh, he was later the Emperor Charles V. So... It went through the usual um, negotiations for these kinds of marriages. There was a, a, a treaty and there were proxy marriages and finally a huge ceremony where Mary was the centre of attention. She kept the audience waiting apparently for three hours until she came in dressed in her golden golden frock um, and was married, married by proxy to um, the Archduke Charles. So she could anticipate that one day she would be uh, Queen of Spain, Duchess of Burgundy, and probably Empress. So she was then referred to from that time forward, from 1507, as the Princess of Castile. So all of the court papers refer to her as um, the Princess of Castile. The other thing around that period, there were a number of different banquets and jousts and all those sorts of things to celebrate um, and she was she would preside as the lady of the joust and give the prizes. And it's probably around that sort of time that she first became aware of um, a young man at court, Charles Brandon, who was a very fine jouster. Mm. So, yes. so then tell me about what happened after Henry the Seventh's death, and how did the Castile marriage kind of fall apart then too? How did we get to France? Well, uh, Henry, Henry VII died in 1509 and he left orders that um, the marriage should go ahead. And if it didn't, he made separate arrangements for her dowry and so forth. And for the first few years of Henry VIII's reign, Mary spent, spent her time at court with Henry and Catherine. She was on very good terms with her sister-in-law. And they seem to have been, you know, quite a had quite a jolly time, the three of them, dancing and jousting and so forth. Then in 1513... Henry, allied to Catherine's father, Ferdinand of Aragon, Maximilian of Austria, who was uh, Archduke Charles's grandfather, as was Ferdinand, and Marguerite, who was Charles's aunt and regent for him in the Netherlands, they uh, formed an alliance to invade France. Mm. Uh, so Henry, Henry thought this was a hell of a fine idea. Mm -hmm. And off he went to France and he captured a couple of towns, uh, later referred to by Thomas Cromwell as ungracious dog holes. <laughs> but yes, he was quite proud of himself. Uh, so, so that all seemed to be going swimmingly. And it was agreed that Mary and Charles would be married the following year. Mm -hmm. But then, um, as happened to Henry on more than one occasion, Ferdinand and Maximilian, uh, double crossed him effectively right. they made they made a secret they each made a secret alliance with france or a secret peace and uh henry was you know obviously he found out about this and he started pushing for the marriage f for mary and charles to take place as had been agreed and uh archduchess marguerite she was very keen as well and um Mary was fitted out with all her clothes and her jewels and uh, henry spent a fortune on it but Maximilian and Charles just dragged their feet and uh, they wouldn't come to the party. They kept putting it off. 
So Henry then thought, okay, well, I know, I know how to get my own back. So he made a separate treaty with Louis uh, for Mary, uh, Louis of France, for Mary to marry him. Mm. And Mary, there she was. She was 18 by now and used to thinking of herself as Princess of Castile. But, you know, the humiliation of the situation uh, must have must have been quite, quite stinging for her, really. She was, you know, being treated very badly. So she uh, publicly renounced her betrothal to Charles and uh, was betrothed by proxy to Louis now, Charles was four years younger than Mary, but Louis was uh, 40, uh, 30 <laughs> years older than her. So uh, yeah. he, was 50, he was 52 and she was, she was 18. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but before we have her go to France, though, so, um, what was her relationship like with Catherine of Aragon? Do we have any kind of um, idea of if they were close? I'm thinking if they both would have been from that Spanish, like, you know, the princess of castile and everything like that um were they were they close friends but it, they seem to have been yes um there's i mean obviously you don't know about that sort of people's personal emotions but mary, mary was always with catherine and henry um i'm presuming that if catherine hadn't liked her she would have made other arrangements mm-hmm. because henry at that time you know would have done anything to please his wife mm-hmm. uh so mary was i i think they they probably thought of themselves as sisters i mean mary probably could hardly remember a time before catherine had mm-hmm. been in her life uh, she'd only been um you know six or so when catherine arrived mm-hmm. so yeah so they, they yeah. Uh, you know i i would guess they thought of themselves more or less as sisters, sisters. yeah yeah i just i often i often think about you know when uh, Henry was double crossed the awkward position that put Catherine in and it did, their, their yeah. um, Mary was in the same kind of position from a different perspective. Um, before, I'll, like I, I'm looking at your website here and the, going into the, the story about uh, Charles Brandon and um, Marguerite. Can you give a little backstory mm-hmm. on that? Yeah. Well, Charles, we have to we have to think that Charles was probably quite a quite a good looking and attractive chap, but he was certainly a man who um, was ambitious and he was perfectly happy in in the way of the times to marry to secure his ambitions. I mean, he'd had a bit of a checkered marital career. He had been um, betrothed to a woman called Anne Brown, and then he. And they'd had a child, but they'd apparently not been married. But then he threw her over for her aunt, who had a had an inheritance. And then that marriage was dissolved, and he married Anne. Mm-hmm. So yeah. And then uh, after the death of both Anne and her, her sister, Mar- her aunt Margaret, he was betrothed to a, a young girl, Elizabeth Grey, who was Viscountess Lyle. Mm. And he went off to uh, the court of the Archduchess Marguerite and they began what you might call a court flirtation, presumably. Um, And it became serious enough for there to be rumours that uh, Marguerite would marry Charles. Now, Marguerite, she'd been twice widowed. Her first marriage had been to Catherine of Aragon's brother, Mm -hmm. but he died young. And then she'd married the Duke of Savoy. And he had also died uh, fairly young and mm-hmm. she'd had no children. Mm-hmm. Uh, so she was only, she was only, I suppose, in her 30s. So she was um, you know, probably like the sight of a young man as much as anybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, of course, she wasn't going to marry right. you know, one of Henry VIII's friends with no background, no breeding, no fortune, no title, no name. Uh, it was around this time that Henry made him a duke, which was a leap from plain Sir Charles and he was born just plain mister, right up to the top of the aristocratic tree. It's possible he thought that uh, that might tempt Marguerite to marry marry his friend. Marguerite's father, Maximilian, was absolutely outraged at the idea. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm just, I mean, apart from anything, he, he seems to have accepted that his daughter didn't want to remarry anybody in particular, uh, you know, at all. And the very idea that she might um, change her mind and marry some upstart just horrified the emperor yeah so uh, marguerite uh, was clearly embarrassed by the whole thing and she asked henry to make sure that um charles didn't come near her court until he was married to his his fiance lady lyle mm. um 
Yeah, but uh, yes, yeah, scandal, scandal, rock, <laughs> rock sport of the of the Netherlands. Mm. And Anne Boleyn potentially would have been would have uh, seen that, huh? Yes, possibly. Yes. So yeah. Anne Anne was uh, obviously one of Marguerite's uh, ladies in waiting or maids of honor. Yeah. So uh, aged about fourteen at the time, thirteen or fourteen. So she would have seen the chivalric sort of codes of honor and people. Um, you know, pretending to be in love and sighing at each other and giving each other, you know, poems and all that sort of thing. Right, right. Uh, so whether or, or whether she then um, saw how badly it could go wrong if uh, people overstepped the mark, um, mm. which, of course, is what happened to her when she and Norris, right. or she overstepped the mark with what she said to Norris. Right. So, um, yeah. yeah. Okay. So then let's, uh, let's take her to France. And, you know, this, like you said, it's such a romantic story. And this is a story that uh, certainly people who watched a particular series <laughs> will know her by a different name in a different country and all of that, but, uh, yes. you know, might have <laughs> been familiar with uh, the story of it, at least, uh, even though the names have been changed and the countries have been changed. Um, but what, what can you tell me about the whole French debacle and uh, and you know that how it all happened, how it played out. Yeah, well, it, I mean, it started out very. I mean, it, from the point of view of of what it was intended to do, it went very well. So Mary uh, Mary arrived in France, having extracted apparently from her brother a promise that if she uh, if she was widowed young, that uh, she could choose a second husband herself. And it was fairly widely known that that Louis wasn't um, wasn't in the pink of health, so I think she had a fairly good chance of of being widowed. Why would Henry have agreed to that? I'm guessing he he agreed to it just to keep her quiet. I would have thought. Yeah, just, Whether he actually, <laughs> given that he didn't have an heir yet, um, it seems like you know women were valuable for their marriage. Um, you know, negotiation or uh, relationships internationally and things like that. Like, it seems like a really big thing for him to have promised that she could choose her own husband, given that he didn't have many children to play the marriage mm. game with. Yeah, I, it's an interesting question. I think in his younger days, he was perhaps uh, more romantically minded. Mm. And he, he was almost certainly assuming that we w- he would have sons because it was it was 15 it was 15, 14. Uh, Catherine had lost two, possibly three children by this point, but uh, he was still optimistic that, um, you know, more ch- that children would come along. Yeah. Um, I think he probably, he, he, he possibly thought that the situation would never actually arise. I mean, if Mary had had children in France, she'd have been the mother of the Queen of France, uh, the King of France. Um, you know, the likelihood that she would then have married it possibly wouldn't have been his concern in a, in a sense mm. if she, if she'd had children. Mm. Um, I think Mary was. I, I you you get get the impression she was quite as impulsive as as her brother and sister were, Henry and Margaret. Um, and Henry seems to have been fond fond of Mary. She a marriage couldn't take place without consent. It's possible, although it doesn't seem very likely, that Mary said she would absolutely refuse to publicly consent unless he had um, promised, made this promise. Um, perhaps he thought, you know, she might cause embarrassment. I don't know. A combination of a combination of things. Probably, I would, I would guess, ultimately, in a weak moment, he saw his sister and said and promised her whatever she wanted to, you know, just get her to do what, what yeah, he wanted. Yeah. And they, um, they would have been close then, having grown up together. It, it would have yes. been a different kind of relationship than some royal. For example, if he would have been raised in Wales as the Prince of Wales, it might have been different. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think that's true. And she, she, as I said before, she, she lived with her, Henry and Catherine. They saw each other every day. They were, all, you know, all the time, and they were um, clearly, you know, attached to each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, so there she is, and she's going to France, and it all looks like it's going to be good. And yes. then and, it's and as, not. Sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, it, it is good as Queen of France. I mean, she, she arrives in France. Um, Louis meets her, you know, the, the, the usual story of uh, having come across her accidentally whilst out hunting, and mm-hmm. they just happen to have the same colored outfits on. And uh, the, the French fashion was to wear matching his and hers outfits for the king and queen mm. yes <laughs> isn't that uh, and, nice uh, 
yeah, she impressed all everybody who saw her with how beautiful she was, how gracious she was, how lovely she was to her her um, fiance, and they got married quite quickly at um, uh, near Abbeville. And yes, yeah, she was an absolute model of good behaviour as the Queen of France. Uh, she sat beside her husband when he was ill. She, you know, sort of fed him with her own hands, all that sort of um, care that she took of him. Uh, she was crowned as Queen of France in Saint Denis, Saint Denis, and mm-hmm. um, you know, had had Louis lived, she would have gone on being Queen of France and being, you know admired for her looks and Louis seemed to dote on her apart from the fact that he sent away her most of her ladies in waiting because uh in particular he didn't like her um her chief lady uh lady Gifford who was sort of the the maternal figure that you know the head of the ladies in waiting mm. and uh, Louis felt that she hovered about far too much when he wanted to be merry with his wife <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that that upset Mary she wrote home to Wolsey and to Henry saying, please, could they, they talk to the king and, and have have Lady Gifford uh, reinstated. But uh, if they did, they didn't, they didn't press the point because she wasn't. So, yeah, so, I mean, it all could have gone well. I mean, hovering on the, on the edges were um, Louis's daughter, Claude, and her husband, Francois, who was Louis's heir, because Claude, who was Anne of Brittany's daughter, couldn't inherit the crown of France. She had been married to... Louis heir, much much to her mother's um, disappointment, as we uh, we discussed previously. Mm-hmm. So Francois was champing at the bit to be king, and Claude was probably um, champing at the bit to be queen consort, even if she couldn't be queen regnant. Had Mary had a son, of course they would have been um, demoted. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, Louis, uh, besotted with his wife, sat up late at night eating and drinking and making merry and uh, wore himself out. And he was dead within um, within a couple of months, or three months. He died on New Year's Day. <laughs> yes. So uh, from that perspective, it went badly in that having been three months Queen of France, she was now widowed mm-hmm. and in a very vulnerable position because... Francois, although he couldn't immediately be proclaimed as king because had Mary been expecting a child, they'd have had to wait to see if if it had been a boy. Right. Um, Francois effectively became king and he, he wasn't quite sure how to handle her. She had to be, um, she, she went into her 40 days of, of mourning as the, as the white queen. Um, but, you know, Francois was eager to know if she was pregnant and he apparently uh, took the opportunity to make uh, suggestions to her that Mary complained to her brother were not to her honour. Mm. So, yeah, Francois was a notorious lecher, so we can mm-hmm. imagine what the suggestions were. Mm-hmm. And he then also tried to put pressure on her to marry uh, one of his French nobles. He wanted her to marry uh, the Duke of Savoy, mm-hmm. but she, uh, she she got letters from Henry and Wolsey saying, you know, don't don't even think about getting involved in a French marriage. Mm-hmm which she wrote back well you know she 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 was quite cross that they thought she was so foolish as to as to get involved in Francois's schemes so she she could see through it yes yeah. yes so yeah. then how do we get Charles Brandon in here well Charles had been one of the uh, people who accompanied Mary in the first place to France so Charles and also um, Mary's cousin uh, Thomas Gray Marcus of Dorset and you know the various other royals and nobles had come to uh, France with her and you know gone to a couple of tournaments and generally shown themselves off and um, made friends with the French court. Uh, Louis had spoken very highly of Charles uh, saying you know that uh, he was a very good servant to to Henry and uh, deserved to be favoured and obviously you know the man made a good impression Mm -hmm. and then Henry decided to send Charles to go and fetch Mary Again, it seems like an odd decision to make if, uh, I mean, the, the whole thing sort of centres around how much Henry knew about the fact that Mary was attached to Suffolk. I, you know, I, I'm not convinced it was entirely a two-way street, but Mary was certainly, um, you know, I, I mean, she possibly you could even say she had a crush on him. I mean, she was 18 and he was 30. No doubt he did think she was attractive. So Henry Henry sent sent him Suffolk to France, but he made him promise that he wouldn't propose to Mary. 
Hmm. He didn't make him promise not to marry her, but he made him promise not to propose. So where would that have even come from, say, having him give, make that promise? Well, he yes. Yeah, so obviously that's, yes, uh, shows that then it must have been open uh, an open secret that there was some kind of uh, relationship or affection between Charles and Mary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Henry must have known about it. But so then you put those things together. You put the fact that uh, Henry had promised she could marry a man of her choice, and she sent, and he sent Suffolk to her, knowing that she was, uh, that she was in love with him. You know, you get, you have to think that Henry thought it might happen, right. and yet, it, as, as you said before, why would he allow his sister, who could be useful to him, to marry marry Charles? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean. Perhaps he wanted to show his power over Charles by by saying, you know, don't don't propose to her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's it's an interesting conundrum. Or perhaps he just did love his sister and want her to be happy. It's it's not the picture we necessarily have of Henry, but maybe maybe she was one of his weak points. He, I mean, he was very he could be very affectionate towards his family. Mm-hmm. And so, tell me, where did they get married, and what happened? What happened when well, it all came out? <laughs> so Char- Charles raced over to France, having promised that he wouldn't propose. And at the same time, Mary was under pressure from Francois to, to pick a French husband. And she 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 panicked, possibly. She thought that Francois would actually hold her in France. Uh, so she pleaded with uh, Charles to marry her. And according to his report, he never saw a woman weep so. Mm. And said that if he wouldn't marry her, she would actually um, take the veil and become a nun. And then she wouldn't be able to marry anybody. Mm. And at the same time, she obviously thought, um, you know, what's the best way to get my own way here? And she thought, well, if I can get Francois on side, that would help. So thinking that Francois mainly wanted her to marry one of his supporters so that Henry wouldn't marry her to, you know, somebody important. uh, She persuaded Francois to support a marriage to Charles and Francois thinking that he was now getting one over on Henry and also taking Mary kind of off the table as a, as a pawn said, okay, I'll, I'll help you out. So he, um, he attended a second secret marriage between the two and promised to write to Henry, uh, to on, on their behalf to, um, mitigate whatever punishment Henry came up with. What was it like when they went back then? Well, Henry, Henry apparently, you know, threw his toys out of the plan completely when he when he was told about the mar- <laughs> mar- So yeah, it's it's very it is all very hazy and it's quite difficult to see a clear motivation from Henry. He seems to be vacillating about the whole thing. But anyway, he was persuaded. Mary deluged him with letters. Charles deluged him with letters. Wolsey, uh, for whatever reason, Wolsey had decided that he would um, speak for them. And Henry was talked round, and the way they talked him round was that old favourite money. Yeah. Mary had a huge dower as as Queen Dowager of France. Henry said, well, okay then, I'll accept your marriage, but um, you're going to have to give me two-thirds of your income as Dowager Queen of France and all your jewels Mm. and all the other debts that uh, Charles already owes me for this, that, and the other. Yeah. So they bought... They bought their pardon. Mm. And so then they were able to return to court and come Yes, had yet another marriage ceremony. Uh, Henry and uh, probably Catherine were concerned, you know, to make sure that it didn't look too much like a, you know, some sort of hole in the corner affair and that the the marriage was a public event and couldn't be questioned. I mean, the worst thing would be if, if Mary had had a child and people had questioned the legitimacy of the marriage because, you know, there'd been no public ceremony. So... Uh, there was a third marriage at Greenwich. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then they really were married. Yeah, for real. <laughs> so then yeah. tell me about what their relationship was like um, after they came home. And again, in that particular television series, you see a lot of stuff of, of uh, there's a lot of drama sometimes with them in terms of like Charles Brandon not being a very nice husband and um, having a lot of affairs and leaving Mary back at home and all of that. Like, what what was it like for real? Well, of course, you, you know, you never know the inner state of people's emotions. It it would appear, as far as you can detect from the evidence, from the first few for the first few years, so say fifteen, 
15, 14 to say, you know, maybe 15, 20, 21, they seem to have spent a, a fair bit of time together, quite often in London. They were still uh, members of the court, and although they were hard up and didn't live there permanently, uh, you, you know, they attended most of the big ceremonies of that, that went on. They were there at the betrothal of uh, Princess Mary in 1518 to the um, to the Dauphin of France. They were part of the entourage that went to the field of cloth of gold, mm -hmm. where Mary, of course, as Dowager Queen of France, uh, you know, she played quite an important role in that. Mm. Uh, so during those years, they appear to have been quite close. Uh, Mary started to suffer from ill health quite soon. Uh, she had uh, she had four children in total. The first one, Henry, Earl of Lincoln, was born about a year after their marriage. Uh, then she had two daughters, Frances and Eleanor. And then um, the young Earl, Henry, he died in 1522. And she had another son the following year, also confusingly called Henry, mm -hmm. <laughs> Earl of Lincoln. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, there's a couple of uh, mentions where Charles says uh, is writing to Wolsey and saying, well, uh, I was going to come to see you, but um, my wife was sick and she felt so ill. She called me back because she, you know, she 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 didn't didn't want me to leave her side because she was too ill. Again, you know, you certainly get the impression that she was very keen on him. Yeah, you you just don't know don't know what what his situation was emotionally. Um, and then after say fifteen twenty two twenty three, they seem to be spend less time together. Possibly the death of their son was um, a factor in that. I mean, it you know it's a, it's it's a terrible thing, and it wasn't like a very young baby. I mean, he was he was six or seven, so you can imagine. Mm. Not that I'm I'm saying that losing a baby is terrible, but yeah. at six or seven, it must have been particularly difficult because you'd have thought mostly by that age they were past the, yeah. the most dangerous years. The year after, as I say, she had another child, um, but then. Her, her health seems to have deteriorated. He spent more time at court. And then, of course, the whole annulment issue started to raise its ugly head um, from sort of 1526, seven onwards. Right. Now, the indication seems to be that uh, neither Charles nor Mary liked Anne Boleyn at all. Uh, and, yeah, um, and that Mary in particular... Um, probably it's hardly surprising that she was going to side with um, Catherine. Now, Mary uh, Anne Boleyn had probably been one of her own ladies or own maids of honour. Uh, so you can imagine that she wasn't terribly pleased at the thought of um, her underling replacing mm -hmm. her sister-in-law. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you get the impression that there was a long, lingering, slow decline in Mary's health through the late 1520s. She, was, um, she spent quite a lot of time going to various religious establishments and being quite a perhaps a more um religious woman than her husband mm -hmm. and you know, you get the impression they just grew apart mm -hmm. yeah and so then um so when when did she die and how did it how did it end yeah so Catherine and Henry well the 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 annulment uh, finally was legislated for in England in um April or uh, April and May of uh, 1533, by which time Mary was uh, terminally ill. Mm -hmm. Again, we don't know what she had. It was over a long period. She, there, there were, uh, even from the, the early 1510, the late 1510, so, I don't know, tuberculosis possibly, yeah. possibly cancer. Um, so, it, yeah, so uh, Catherine was, was finally uh, cast off and Anne Boleyn was proclaimed as queen. Charles was Lord Steward and he had some uh, significant responsibilities around arranging Anne's coronation, mm -hmm. which Mary didn't attend, probably uh, quite apart from anything else, she would, she would have been too ill by, mm -hmm. by the 1st of June. Uh, and there's uh, Charles paid her a visit in May, but he didn't come back in June and he wasn't there when she died. Mm. He didn't attend the funeral, but that was that was normal. Husbands didn't attend uh, their wives' funerals. That was that was pretty standard. But um, he consoled himself within six weeks by um, marrying Catherine Willoughby, right? His fourteen-year-old ward who was betrothed to the young Earl of Lincoln. Isn't that convenient? Yeah, I know. It's it's it must have been tough for him that one. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not like, I mean, you know, many people married quite quickly, but this does seem particularly um, tasteless, Mm -hmm. especially since she was um, betrothed to his son, who did in fact die young, but hadn't died by that point. Yeah. What did people think about it when that happened? Like, was it gossip? Um, there was there were, gossip? Yeah, there were a couple of snarky remarks in some of the ambassador's reports, but I, possibly because Mary had been away from court for so long, people didn't really talk about it that much. And there is one quite interesting throwaway remark that uh, it seldom seems to be picked up on. Anne Boleyn at one point, and I think it must have been about 1532, one, 1531 or 32, uh, apparently accused Charles of... Um, molesting his daughter oh and i have i think i mean she doesn't say who but of course catherine willoughby would have been called charles's daughter because she was married or she was due to marry his son and it seems to me more likely i mean who knows that um that catherine had been the lucky recipients of her future father-in-law's attentions rather than charles's own daughters but who knows she's horrible well, we don't know that we don't know that that's true. Anne Boleyn said some pretty yeah, harsh yeah, things about quite a few yeah, people. Sure. She was obviously a woman with a uh, she had know, a, a, a knack for, <laughs> for for sharp remarks. So yeah. she might. Have, but it isn't. It's an odd thing to come up with completely out of the blue. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that would be my guess that he'd shown an already shown an interest in the girl. But, All um, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, where where can people learn more about Mary if they want to dig deeper into her life? There's the the latest biography is uh by a lady called Sarah Bryson. There's one uh one published a few years ago, a joint biography with um her sister Margaret Queen of Scots by Mar- Mariah Perry. There's a very very detailed um Victorian one but still very good Mary Ann Everett Wood who wrote some very good stuff she was she was she did a lot of historical research and it's in contained in a volume called Lives of the Princesses of England I think uh Erin Sadler an American academic has done an academic um study of her letters you know brought them all together and catalogued them and um you know very very detailed study of Mm. those there's uh, a biography by Stephen Gunn published couple of years ago I think on Charles but that's very much about Charles and his political role and I think Mary gets you know half a dozen mentions um Mm -hmm. doesn't talk about their relationship yeah and then of course your your Tudor time site why what's like her legacy why is she worth learning about oh I think I think she's interesting because it did show that a woman who could um, stand up against the the convention of the time and choose a husband if she was prepared to, you know, take a gamble and go through with it. Uh, I mean, it was a huge gamble. Henry Henry might have taken far more drastic action than he did, although we have to think of Henry in his early days. He, you know, although the, the odd head had disappeared, you know, been struck off by now, they, they weren't flying out at every angle at the time that Mary sure. married Charles. Um I suppose she's interesting because that makes her a, a real person with real emotions and real feelings about her, her life. And the it's probably a fairly early example of people thinking that love is a good basis for marriage. Mm. You know, the, the, the convention was that you married somebody and then you fell in love with them. And that mm-hmm. and you were supposed to. That That was it. You were supposed to love your spouse, but you didn't love your spouse until after you married them. So she's a very early example of of saying no. Actually, I'm going to marry the person I love. Good honor. Yeah. Well, yes. Though I I wonder, you know, later when she's hard up for cash because they're all, they're always hard up because of um, you, you know, I mean, in relative terms. But she certainly mm-hmm. didn't live as a as a queen dowager. Whether occasionally when she made the visits to court, she thought that she'd made the right decision. I don't know. Because, you know, especially when in the later years when Charles perhaps didn't treat her that well. Although, mm-hmm. as I say, you, you, we can't know that. We can only infer from, you know, and I think the, 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 the hasty remarriage gives an idea. Because she could have been an empress. And, it, you know, it's what do they say? Love flies out the window when poverty comes in the door. 
Thank you again to Melita Thomas for taking the time to tell us about Mary the French Queen. For more information, go to tutortimes.co.uk or see the resources available on the Englandcast site at englandcast.com. And remember to please support the Tutor Planner if you love planning and tutors. And you can get the links to that Indiegogo campaign at englandcast.com or on the Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash englandcast. Thank you so much in advance. I'll be back again in about two weeks. The next episode I'm going to do is on the menagerie at the tower. You knew there was a zoo at the tower, right? With gifts of exotic animals from foreign dignitaries and kings and everything like that. So I'm going to do an episode on the menagerie at the tower. Something I've always wanted to know about. So there we go. All right. Thanks so much for listening. I will be back in two more weeks. Bye-bye. Dead or worth in dying, grazie.